Um, my name is Dennis Allen and I'm from Inuvik originally and uh, we live in the Yukon now but I'm a filmmaker by day and uh, I play music as well and lately I've been uh, making my living as a storyteller but I didn't know really how I was going to approach today so I had to phone my wife <laughs> and she gave me a bunch of notes on how to how to talk about storytelling. But uh, I grew up in Inuvik and I uh, had an interview today with Allison at CBC and she wanted to know how, where it all began. And storytelling always begins at home, whether you live on a farm or, or if you live in a, out in the bush. Storytelling comes from, for me, storytelling came from, comes from experiences. Uh, my dad's experiences trapping, uh, running dog teams, there's lots of dog team stories. Um, so when I think about where I learned how to tell stories, I learned how to tell stories by listening to my dad. He was a master storyteller, he's gone now. Uh, people like the Métis people were really good storytellers. Uh, Joe Burke, um, Johnny Raymond, old uh, Donald Greenland from McClavick, these guys were all old Métis trappers that ended up in the, up in the north, and a lot of them come from Fort Chip, um, Lac La Biche area. Um, so that's how we kind of grew up listening to these stories. And also, m my dad's uncle was a man named Abe Ukpik, and he was, a, he was a, another master storyteller, but his kind of claim to fame was, he gave all the Inuit people their names back during a project called Project Surname. Uh, when we were growing up, we saw these little brown discs, and it had, if you were from the Western Arctic, it was a number, the letter was W, my, I remember mine was W1846. That was, that was how people, or that's how the government um, used you in a statistic. That, that's how they identified you. So all of the Inuit people, in Nunavut especially, had these, E, e numbers because they were from the east so they had so Uncle Abe went to all the communities and he gave all the Inuit people their names back but with all their right spellings all their traditional names so that's kind of where his kind of claim to fame is but I grew up listening to those two mostly and um, and again you know I, I do I feel really humbled up here and I feel like I'm kind of kind of stuck you know sometimes I think Alex I know Alex is a good storyteller and I, I love watching Alex on and Paul and William you know uh, you know such great storytellers eh? and I'm, I'm pleased to I'm pleased to be the the out in front of, for all the storytellers out there so but uh, Jennifer gave me some notes <laughs> but um I, I guess uh, where I, where I uh, really learned the craft of storytelling was, of course, listening to, listening to my dad and all those elders tell stories, but what I, what, where I really learned it was when I went to film school. Because in film school, they taught us about script writing, they taught us about act structures, three act structures, character arcs, um, story arcs, episodic arcs, when, we, when we're talking about writing episodic TV. And uh, so I took, I took those, two, those two learnings and then I kind of incorporated them into my storytelling. And the way I got into, the, into the, those stories uh, that uh, Lee was referring to in Take Two in the News North, I was asked, or actually I approached News North and I asked them if I could write a column. I didn't know what I was gonna write about, I just wanted to write. And uh, I'm trying to think of who was the editor at the time, they've been through so many editors, but anyways, the guy said, sure, you know, what do you wanna write about? I said, I wanna write about the arts, because uh, I wanna write about filmmaking and playing music, so. So uh, I started writing these columns, and then I started throwing in, in these little these little, uh, these little stories about my alter ego, Chubby. And, and then pretty soon, they, it, everything turned into these stories about Chubby and me. And, and I was having so much fun with him. I had so much fun with him because 
people used to come up to me and they say, are those true stories? And if there was someone from the north like Paul or William or John was standing beside me, they would say, yep, it happened somewhere. <laughs> and they have. <laughs> or Kathy, you know, they, they, all those stories have happened somewhere, right? When, and that's why people like them so much. And, and Jennifer told me earlier, she said, you know, Dennis, you write for your audience. And I do. My, and my audience is our northerners. My audience are people who understand what I'm talking about. Um, and if someone else gets it, that's, you know, that's good, right? That's all, all the much. But I, I, give that, I give that voice to, to I have, that's how I get that distinctive voice is because I write for my audience. So, um, I'm just trying to, I'm, I'm just trying to wing it here with these, what little notes I got. So anyways, I, I started writing, I started writing these stories about Chubby and me, and all the stories in Chubby and me, they did happen to somebody somewhere. Um, like, maybe not the exact same incident, but, but, uh, you know, this, the same kind of humor. And Allison asked me a question today, and, and also some, some other people asked me, where do you get your material from? You know, as Native people, as Aboriginal people, we're still transitioning from, from one way of life into another. There's still people, like for me example, I love being out in, in the bush, we call it being out in the bush. I love being out on the land and being around elders, but also I love my MacBook Pro. <laughs> so, and then all of the, all of the kind of incidents, so we're still, so just that alone, that transition alone kind of um, provides me with a lot of, a lot of material. But uh, Chubby and, the Chubby and Me stories were, um, were, uh, it's still my favorite, my, it's still my favorite uh, way to write. I started, and I was telling everybody today that I'm trying to get away, not trying to get away from making films, but I'm going to spend a lot of my time writing, just writing. And, and, uh, my, and my characters are still, are still the Chubby and Me characters, but with not such slapstick little events that they, that they do in Take Two, more, you know, more... Um, not serious issues, but more uh, more experiences that they're having. So that's what I'm that's what I'm doing with these um, with these uh, with these stories. Um, you know, I'm feeling a little stuck here, <laughs> but I just I just you know I just want to say that I do. I really feel humbled sitting up here talking about storytelling. I I don't feel that old. Uh, you know, I, I, I feel young, and, and again, you know, Alex, I'm sorry to, to point, keep pointing you out, but uh, people like you and Paul and William are, are all my kind of role models for storytelling. What I, I hear, you know, I hear, I hear your stories and then listen to Paul and William on the radio for years and years. I take all of that, I take all those experiences and Lee, I take all those experiences and then I kind of put my own, put my own little... Um, my own little uh, humor to it. And, you know, an another thing about storytelling too is all these great storytellers, their stories come from experiences that they have or other people have, and everybody adds their own little twist to it. <laughs> and uh, I remember my dad would, would tell a lot of stories about trapping and, and, and dog teams. They would always talk about trapping and dog teams and, and the brew pot. There's lots of stories around the brew pot because that's been our history. Was, was, uh, there was a lot of, a lot of moonshine making back, <laughs> back when my dad was a young man, when he was a young boy. So he saw all of those and so a lot of those stories come from there. So now my stories, I didn't have that. I didn't have those experiences so I make them up I make them up as I'm, as I'm going along. And I wanted to share a story with you. Um, I was working with this young boy, real kind of uh, uh, full of beans young guy, and we drove over with a boat to a clavic. 
and when you get somebody that naive, that's perfect material right there. <laughs> so, I was just waiting for my chance to, to uh, do something with him, eh? And it came, we went to a Klavik for a film. I was working on a TV show. Uh, and uh, and uh, so we went over to a Klavik and through, in the Mackenzie Delta, there's all kinds of channels. It's really easy to get lost in there, eh? And so we're driving across, and that's when I started putting a bug in his ear. I was like, oh, uh, yeah, I think it's this way. And we'd go this way and snake our way through the delta, and we made it to a clavic. <laughs> so we're driving back, and then I deliberately take a wrong channel. And I got them all. I said, oh, shit. I think I'm getting, he got all paranoid. He said, oh, geez, I think I'm going the wrong way here. And I had a sat phone. So I pretended to call Jojo Arian in Nuvik. I said, yeah, Jojo, I think I'm lost here. What do you want me to do? Do you want me to keep going? Okay. I don't know if I'll have enough gas, though. So, so he was getting all paranoid, and he was saying, geez, don't you think we should turn back? And I said, no, 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 it's, let's, let's just keep going. So we'd go, and there'd be channels this way, and... Oh shit, I don't know what to do here. Pray with me, pray with me. <laughs> he grabbed my hand and I said a little prayer and I said, okay, I think we gotta go this way. And we come to another channel. Shit, which way to go? Take out a quarter and I flipped it. And we're going this way. So all the way back through the delta, he was just dead quiet. And we came to a big channel and I said, I think we gotta go upstream. But I can't really tell which way is upstream here. Old timers told me you gotta piss in the water and watch for the bubbles. <laughs> so I said, do you, you gotta do it. So he took a piss and the bubbles were going this way and oh yeah, upstream's this way. So <laughs> we went and we finally made it to Inuvik. And we got to Inuvik and I told Jojo, I said, Jojo, come on, let's, let's, Keep this going here. So Jojo said, I heard you guys had a near miss. And I said, yeah, we just about got lost. And he says, well, I'm on search and rescue. And you got to report it. You got to write up our report. And then he said, he was doing all of these things. And then he said, then when I came to the channel, I had to urinate in the water <laughs> to find out which way the bubbles were going. So he could go upstream, and I said, oh, those old-timers don't know what urinate means. Say so you took a piss. <laughs> so anyways, we got this report, and Jojo took it to the Hunters and Trappers Association, and we got Hank Rogers involved. So Hank signed off, and he put a little note in there. We had another trip coming up on the river, but he didn't want to go anymore. <laughs> But anyways, though, that's kind of how, how, how my stories evolve, I guess, just from, just from experiences. These stories, they're, they're told from one person, and the next person hears it all the way down the line until it got to me. But it involves, um, it involves an old-timer an, uh, old in uh, Lower Post, B.C. He was, um, his boys were drinking in his house, and he was living in a little log house, little log cabin. And his boys were in there real rowdy. And he got tired of them, so he took his shotgun and he shot, double barreled shotgun, boom, boom. And the boys took off and the cops came. And they charged him with a illegal discharge of a firearm. And he didn't speak, he didn't speak English, he speak Casca. So they brought him to court, big court came and all these people came in from Whitehorse. And they brought in an interpreter and uh, old Jimmy, she, uh, the judge gave him six months probation, and so the interpreter told him in Casca, they're going to babysit you for six months. And so the judge said, Mary, what did you tell Jimmy? I told him that you're going to babysit him for six months. No, that's not what probation is. Can you explain to Mr. Mr. Jimmy here that that he's on probation for six months. He had a hell of a time trying to explain probation. Then she, she told him, you got to be good for six months. <laughs> and, and the judge said, 
Mary, what did you tell him? What did you tell Jimmy? I told him he's got to be good for six months. No, that's not what probation is. She got pissed off and she grabbed her jacket and she told him something in Casca and she was going out the door and the judge said, Mary, what did you tell Jimmy? I told him, you can't shoot at anybody for six months. <laughs> <laughs> and she walked out the door. <laughs> so those are stories. Those are just stories that I hear and I'm innocent. I just, those are just stories that I hear and I don't know how to give a lecture other than to tell you a couple more stories. Um, I got a good friend in, in, uh, and good friends are good fodder for uh, storytelling. We always try and up one another. But uh, my friend, he was living in Whitehorse and this is a true story. The first part is true and then I made up the rest. I always say, <laughs> I always say most of my stories are true, but a lot of them aren't. So that's my disclaimer. So his, his granddaughter came home from school one day and she said, Abba, are you an elder? And he was, he was 50. And he said, I guess so. I'm 50. That says right in the interview with final agreement. 50 and over is elder. I, I guess so, he said. So he, she said, can you come and tell, tell us stories tomorrow or next week. And he said, I guess so. So little Trinity went back to school and she told her teacher, my Abba's coming in, he's Inuit. So all the kids studied up on Inuit people. They went on Google and they, Wikipedia and found out who the Inuit are. And Ipan came into, came into class and all the little kids. Have you ever lived in an igloo? Nope. Have you ever hunted polar bears? No. Do you eat seals? Nope. And one little kid in the back said, You suck! <laughs> and he was looking around, and <laughs> looking at the teacher, and she said, Give Mr. Harry a hand, please. <laughs> thank you, thank you. And he went to the office and he picked up his check. <laughs> and he called me and he said, Kentucky Fried Chicken on me. <laughs> so all those stories, they come from... And then one time my dad... I used to, I used to like listening to my dad's stories. There was an old Anat cook, they called him uh, Medicine Man. I used to like, love hearing medicine man stories. You know the reindeer herders when they came into the Delta in 1930, 1931 or whatever, they skied across the Laplanders, the Sami people, and they had those funny little shoes and they had real colorful outfits and stuff. And they skied and my dad and my dad and his grandfather and his grandparents and some other old Inuvialuit were sitting in their house on, uh, uh, on, in Kennel Island and there was an old Anatkuk, old shaman that was living in a little house by himself and they were having a brew party, excuse me, drinking home brew and moonshine and then probably eating makdak and knock on the door and then there was these three Sami skiers, they skied across and they were looking for a crossing for the reindeer. So they skied and they knocked, and the first time they seen, first time they seen these, these kind of people, these Sami people, and they were kind of taken aback, and they'd already had a few cups of brew in them, so they were, they were like, holy shit, who's this guy here? So they said, well, come in. You know, they're, come in, have something to eat. And so the Sami people, they ate some caribou meat, and the Samis like to drink too, eh? So they all got into the brew and they're all drinking and then pretty soon the Sami started yoiking, doing their yoiks. And that old Anat Guk was getting jealous because uh, everybody was watching these people and paying more attention to them than him. So he stood up and he took off his parky and bare chested and he said, I'm going to fly to the moon. <laughs> Watch this. <laughs> and, so everybody was watching him, but he was too drunk and he fell in the wood box. And he was laying in the wood box. And every 
half hour or so, he'd jump up and he'd say, I'm going to fly to the moon. <laughs> and he'd fall back in the wood box again. Anyways, that was a little story from my dad. <laughs> But I told a story, I don't know if you heard it on CBC today, but this is where the, the joke, the original joke originated from my dad. There was an old Eskimo guy who lived on Herschel Island. He never ate white man food before. So he came to a clavic and they were living across a clavic at Pokiak Channel. And, and uh, that old man came over and he talked to my dad's grandfather and he said, I want to eat white man food. I never tried white man food before. So my, dad, uh, my dad's grandfather, Amaung, he told my dad, he said, go take that old man to Peffer's Cafe across here, and he wants to try white man food. So my dad was just eight, nine years old. He didn't. So he said, okay, so they walked across. He didn't know that you had to pay for it. And they got over there, and Marine, Marine Morfitt's, uh, it was her aunt or her mom was the, wait, was the waitress, and she said, Victor, you need money. You need money to order. And so he told that old man in Eskimo, you need money. And that old man dug in his pocket and he had two dimes or something and a nickel. And to him, that was money. So he put it on the table and the woman said, that's all you got. Only thing you can have is hot dog. So my dad told that old timer, he said, all you can buy is hot dog meat. <laughs> hot dog meat. And that old timer thought, huh, hot dog meat. <laughs> okay, these guys are, white man food is kind of funny, all right, but I guess I'll try it because he remembers times of famine. They used to, people used to eat dog meat. It would be like eating click <laughs> or, or beans or whatever, like poor man's food. So that old man said, sure, I guess so. <laughs> so Maureen's mom came back with two hot dogs. And the old man looked at it, and he looked at my dad, and he told him an Eskimo, asked him if they got any ribs. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so just, just stories like, oh, just, just uh, hearing stories like that. But I'm writing more, like, I want to write, I want to, actually, I want to do a book. I want to write a book of, like, using the chubby and me characters. So I'm writing longer stories, and the way I force myself to write longer stories is that I join uh, contests, writing contests. One right now I'm writing is 10,000 word, 10, word um, story. Those chubby and me's were like four or five hundred words. I just bang it off and wait for my check. <laughs> it was just a way to get fast money, a tank of gas. But, um, and people always ask me who chubby is. He's a real person. I'll tell you this right now. He's a real person, but he warned me that if I ever disclose his name, we're going to court. So I can't disclose his name. And, and people keep bugging me to, to di disclose his name, but we're going to go to court if he does, because I implicated him too many times. <laughs> And like I said, you know, stories come from my experiences. Eh? There was these guys that I grew up with, same age as me, a couple of years younger. And this was when I was, when we were all kind of in our party mode. We were early 20s, mid 20s, and we're all partying. And the, these guys, they never worked in their life. And one day they showed up in the bar, brand new clothes, buying rounds, and I said, holy shit, where'd you get all this money from? He said, I'm bootlegging. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah, you got lots of money, you got brand new clothes. Okay, right on. So they buy drinks all weekend, stay in the hotel, bring us out for supper. And they'd go back and they'd come back a week later again, buying rounds, taking us out for dinner. And we found out later that they stole a check making machine. <laughs> and so I went to visit them in jail. <laughs> Both of them were in jail, so I was down in Yellowknife for something, and, and both of them were sitting in jail when I got, when I got there, and uh, they wanted me to buy them cigarettes. But uh, 
I didn't buy them cigarettes. I, I just, uh, I just thanked them for all the good times they, <laughs> all the good times they gave. I said, let me know when you're getting out again. <laughs> so like I said, I just come across it. I like, you know what I like to do is challenge myself. I like to make up stories right on the spot. But I'll tell you a story about my wedding ring. Not this one, I had a gold one. Big, heavy gold one. Jennifer made me buy a big, friggin' $900 ring. <laughs> we had a friend who was a jeweler, and she said, get James to make you a ring. And there was $900. James said, yeah, I'll make you one for $900. And right about that time on Trader Time, there was a nine and a half horse kicker for $900. And I said, why don't I buy one from Walmart and then I can buy this kicker. And <laughs> she said, okay, but here's the deal. When the kicker breaks down, we're done. <laughs> so, so I said, okay, well, I guess I'm getting the ring. <clears throat> and Jennifer, she, she never grew up, she didn't grow up with this kind of humor. She gets pissed off at me when I talk about my friends. Eh? <laughs> she says, you know, you, sh you, you shouldn't. You shouldn't talk about your friends like that. I'm wondering, um, you talk about a lot of male storytellers. Are there female storytellers that influenced you as well? Yeah, that's a good point. Uh, my mother, Bertha, my mother, Bertha Allen, uh, Auntie Marine Morfitt, Janie Wright. Um, there's, there's, I guess, you know, you probably, if a woman was up here, Kathy would probably tell you a, a lot more uh, female storytellers. But yeah, of course there's, there's good women storytellers. Oh, you know who was really good was uh, Elder Winnie Cockney, my brother Jerry's mother-in-law, because she, she grew up, she, she caught the last end of the real old Eskimos. And so I used to like sitting with her when we used to go to her fish camp when we were, when we were kids. And, and uh, she'd tell us stories after supper about um, cro crossing uh, from Bailey Island to Banks Island with a schooner. That's 150 mile crossing and all the bad weather they run into. And she'd tell stories about, you know what I really like about, now that you, I think about it was uh, Winnie Cockney, Persis Grubin, Alexandria Elias, these are all elders that are gone now. But the, I found that the women would talk about like real true experiences, you know, <laughs> you know, and all these other guys were bullshitters, you know, and they were good at it too. But the women, like, uh, more, believable. more believable, yeah. Do you think they more were trying to teach when telling stories as opposed to entertain? Yeah, yeah, good point. That's a good point. Somebody put that in the report. Any, any uh, anthropologists around <laughs> or sociologists? But yeah, that's a good point because we called her Nanang Winnie, grandma, grandmother Nanang is grandmother. We used to call all the old elders Nanang. But Nanang Winnie, she used to all, every, all her stories were about actual experiences. <laughs> and these other guys were all trying to one up each other. And I just, I guess I gravitated towards them because that's kind of, but, but that's a good point. All, all the elder, all the old, older ladies, they talked, they would talk about, uh, you know, how they used to work at caribou skins. And, and, and when I traveled to Joe Haven and Tullyuak, I, I, I would sit with, the, I would sit with, uh, sit with those uh, older women and they would, they would speak in inuktitut, but they knew I was listening. They knew I was curious and they would, they would tell me stories. The best story I heard was in, was in uh, Joe Haven. Doggone if I can remember their name, but they were talking about living in an igloo till 1969. They had a picture. There was a picture in an actual picture book of these two couples. They were young at that time. They were, they were um, a young family, and they were live, still living in an igloo in 1969. And she told me about what it was like to live in an igloo, you know? And she said it, was, it wasn't cold. It was, you know, you had your little kulik. You had your little kulik and it provided heat. And she said they always had a, and there was a picture there with a big cast iron 
uh, pot and they were boiling seal meat. It takes a long time to boil, but they had that. And I really, I really enjoyed listening to them. I really do enjoy listening to the, to, uh, the old, older women tell stories. So, but that's a really good point. Thanks for bringing it up. I'm just kind of wondering, like films like CDQM and your chubby character, what, what do you feel like they've given back to you? Mm. What have they give? What have my films given back to me? Um, identity, I guess. And you know what I'm always looking for? I'm always look. Not that I'm always looking for respect, but when I get respect back from the community, like from these elder ladies, that's what I'm. That's what I really cherish, because they. I'm. I'm just naturally curious, and my father was like that. He was just naturally curious, and when. When we showed CBQM, and uh, or even when I was filming CBQM, I was I was genuinely curious to hear their stories, you know. And so, when when they open up to me, when people open up to me, that's that's what I'm looking for right there. Is w once people open up to me and relax and just be themselves, then I can roll my camera, and then I can capture, then I can capture the true spirit and the true intent of their character. So that's, you know, that's what I look for, right? So um, when I travel around, I always seek out elders, you know, because those are the ones that are, the, they're the knowledge. You know what, I just had a really good visit with Jerry Antoine in, in Fort Simpson. Jerry caught the last end of the old Denny people. And he almost had to kick me out of the restaurant and he said, come on, your screening is, going here we better get going but he was telling me he was telling like like jerry is not one of those bullshit storytellers he's he's a he's a real traditional storyteller and he was telling me uh he was telling me about going hunting with his father-in-law up in wrigley and how that old man uh traveling with dog teams and really traditional ways of just doing things on the land i was so curious i was so intrigued by it and that's and when i when I seek these people out and I, I actually listen to what they're saying, they open up and, and then they give you. And that's, that's what I get back and that's what I hope. And that, so I take that energy and I take that goodness and I try to put it out there and portray, even in Chubby and Me, all, all of those wayfaring characters in Chubby and Me are all people that I know. And that's why I say, uh, when people say, did those things happen? Are those people real? Yeah, they are real. And those, those, those situations did happen. So that's what I get back from, from, uh, from storytelling and from filmmaking. Yeah, no, it's a drama. <laughs> Friday night about 10 o'clock when all those girls had a few beers, that's when I go on Facebook. How do you think Facebook can fit into this whole story telling? How would you Facebook? That, that's a good question. Like how does Facebook fit into, fit into, I love Facebook. I love, I love going on there and, and, and uh, you know, pulling legs, <laughs> you know. Uh, because, I mean, now I can reach, I don't know, I got 1,100, 1,200 friends, and I could reach them instantly, you know? I don't have to phone them up, or I, they don't have to hear down the road. Technology, uh, you know, it, it's, you know that film, um, Making Fire with Gunpowder? It's the, it's the story of how the Inwood Broadcasting Corporation started um, way back in the early 70s, Terry knows. Uh, and the, 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 the analogy that they used was, you can take a shell, a bullet, you pull the, you, you pull the bullet off and you put the gunpowder on some twigs and then you light it and, psh, and it makes a fire and it makes something useful. Or you could be careless and it'll explode on you. 
So I don't know. I I, I think uh, social media is like that too. The in, the the internet is, the internet can do that too, right? You know, uh, you know. You see people. You see you see all kinds of drama on Facebook. Um, but yeah, I, I you know I use it. I I like I like going on there and 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 uh, <laughs> telling stories. Sometimes when I can't when I quit I I, I haven't written uh, Chubby and Me stories for a while, so I need to. Sometimes I have the urge to tell a story, so I just go on there and make something up. <laughs> but yeah, no, that's a good question. Any other questions for Dennis? Can I tell you one more story? Yeah, please. Um, true story. <laughs> I was uh, driving taxi in Inuvik, and... Uh, I was, uh, okay, I'll warn you right now, it's got a little sexual content to it. <laughs> this is what Jennifer gets pissed off about. She says, all you bullshitters, you always throw in sex and booze in your, or cheating or lying. And uh, so uh, I get in trouble for telling this story, but it's a true story. Trust me. I was driving. I was driving a taxi, and it was 42 below, and we broke down the thermostat. Got stuck at Barcy, between right between the New York and Tuckin, was blowing like a bastard. The thermostat is a is a little thing that regulates your heat to your cab. So it got stuck, and and um, so I took it off. It was colder than, colder than hell, but I, somehow I got it off, but I tore the gasket. And so I didn't know, I tried all kinds of stuff. There was a, I found a, somebody had a cowboy boot and I cut out, a, I cut out a cow, the leather and I tried it, but it cooked. We only went about a mile and it, it cooked and it, 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 uh, it didn't work. So we didn't have anything, but I was, I was dating this, the barmaid, and she gave me her gym bag to um, put my clothes, my extra clothes in. So I was digging around in the gym bag and no word of a lie, there was a big rubber dildo was in there. And uh, I said, oh shit, this might work. <laughs> so we're looking around, anybody got a knife? No, no one had a knife, but there was an ax. So you know how thin a, a gasket is? About a millimeter, and we're we're screwed. So I thought, well, what am I gonna do? So there was two elders from Tuckwar in there, and some other some other young guys. And somebody said, just try it with that axe. Try cut a sliver off. And so I took it out and I put it on the ice, and I was gonna try cut it, but the, the axe bounced back up, and uh, it would it wasn't working. And uh, so the elder had an ulu, <laughs> and she took it and she cut me a gasket, <laughs> and it was just the right size. It was just the right size for the for the thermostat, and it worked. And we got to tuck. And when we got there, she told her daughter in Eskimo, ask him for that little thing because she needs it for to plug her sink. <laughs> so, so. Uh, when you cook maktak in the summertime, you use bathtubs and the, the, the hole is really big, eh? So she wanted to plug it for the sink. And so uh, I knew damn well that if my girlfriend, I would have to replace that thing and I didn't know how much they were. So I thought, you know, they're at least 50 bucks. So I said, well, 50 bucks, you can have it for 50 bucks. But all she had was half a pack of cigarettes and four bucks and I didn't have any more smoke so I took it. Anyways, I got, I got back home and she got really mad at me. She said I would never measure up to what that, what that thing would did for her. <laughs> so anyways, I slept on the couch for two weeks. True story.
<laughs> True story. Anyways, ¿más sí?